Okay, my guest today is Dr. Charles Murray, and my friend challenged me to introduce him without using the words very and super, so let's try. Charles Murray is a political scientist, a writer, and a public speaker. He is a WH Brady Scholar at the AEI, and he is a household name in the field of intelligence, the ramifications of affirmative action, and human genius. And basically, he needs no introduction. But having said that, he is the author of many important books, such as Losing Ground, which is, by the way, this is a Hebrew version of it. The notoriously famous Bell Curve, which he co-authored with Dick Ernstein, with the late Dick Ernstein, and all the other books I have uh, just, just on Kindle. <laughs> so Coming Apart, which is, in my opinion, a mind-blowing work of genius, human accomplishment, human diversity, and most recently, Facing Realities, Two Truths About Race in America. Dr. Charles Murray is probably the most important political scientist in the 20th century, and definitely the most controversial. And I must say that two authors really paved my way in the field of intelligence. One is Richard Heyer, and the other is Dr. Charles Murray. So it's my true privilege to have him on the show today. Dr. Charles Murray, good morning, and many thanks for taking the time speaking with, with me today. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Oh, thank you. I'm so excited. I will put on my uh, dress shirt. I thought about wearing a tie, but then I thought, eh, I mean, after all, <laughs> I'm, an, I'm an Israeli. So I want to start the conversation first by thanking Amiad Cohen, the CEO of the Tikva Fund, for making it possible. And before we dig in, in one of the, your interviews, you said that the bell curves sold really well and was a big scandal. And what it ended up with that you sat in your house and enlarged your wine collection with many bottles from the year 94. And can you think of any comparable academic scandal to the scandal that emerged with the publication of the Belkov? Because I almost compare it to the Scope Monkey trial. Well, 19th century, I don't know enough to uh, describe the, the uh, furor over the publication of Darwin, uh, but certainly intellectually, it was, it attracted a, a, probably the greatest uh, a scientific uh, controversy in history. In terms of the 20th century, um, it's hard to think of one that got more attention than the bell curve and got more immediate tension and uh, and, and brutal in, in the sense that in, in previous times there had been arguments over books but that they at least pretty much stuck with what the person had said uh, and, and trying to refute it with the bell curve. Dick Hernstein and I were pilloried for saying, what, what, what most people who are watching this who haven't read The Bell Curve think is, oh, that's the book that tried to prove that Blacks are genetically inferior to whites. And so the biggest surprise people get when they open up The Bell Curve is that's not the topic of the book. And not only that, we have one paragraph in which we have one sentence which says, it's probably the case that both genes and nature have, uh, and nurture have some relationship to the difference in black and white test scores, but nobody knows how much that might be. And, and that was a you, and, intense controversy. And if you're inclined to just one thing, we made our uh, job bad. This is something that you also write in the Belkov. I think Jordan Peterson said that it was uh, the most famous book that people speak about, but never read it. Yes. Uh, the, the number of people who uh, think they know it was in the bell curve and wrote about it who hadn't read it is is amazing and that, that's you know it's it's kind of uh, if, if you're criticizing someone for something you haven't read you run the danger of saying really stupid things and a lot of them did say really stupid things but there were so many other people who wanted to believe the worst that very few people got called out publicly for having simply lied about the book. Now, I'm saying that as a person who was on the receiving end, but I think that's a fair statement. There were a variety of people who wrote about the bell curve who I know personally, 
They are very smart. They are very well read on many things. They could not have made the accusations they made about the bell curve without knowing that they were lying. And that bothered me a lot. Yes, definitely. So from the bell curve, from the 1994 book to uh, 2021 book, and which are, in essence, quite similar. So in your new book, Facing Reality, you present two truths that are immensely important in, the, in understanding the social life in modern America. So the truth number one is, and let me quote you, the rate of violent crime in black communities is much higher than Asian or white communities. This is one. And uh, truth number two, or fact number two, that there are different means and distribution in cognitive abilities between whites, black, Latinos, and Asian. And I would add that this is the next truth, or this truth is just a fancy way to say that on average, blacks score lower on IQ test. And this is still a fancy way to say that on average, blacks are less intelligent than white. And once you factor in those truths, a lot of what we call systematic racism can be clearly explained. So you put on your uh, intelligent glasses and all of a sudden everything become clear. So before we move on, is this a fair summary? Is that what? Is, is this what it just said about your book, Facing Reality, is a fair summary? Yeah, yes, it is. Truth? Just elaborate a little bit. Um, there are a couple of things I stress throughout the book. And the first of these is one that I think is really relevant to the whole controversy in the United States about uh, uh, systemic racism. It is one thing to argue, as, as many people do, that the inequalities in American life, uh, racial inequalities are uh, ultimately traceable to racism. It, it's a case that needs empirical examination, but it's a case that can, you can try to make. Here's the point I try to, try to emphasize in the book. That's fine if we're thinking about the future. If we're thinking about what's going on in the United States right now, you have to cope with what is, all right? And let's take crime as the example. Uh, it would be great if we had programs that could reduce the, the racial difference in, in uh, violent crimes. Great, for the future. But in terms of what a police officer faces when he or she goes out into uh, a community, th that reality has to be dealt with today. And a teacher who is in a classroom has to deal with the students in front of her or him today. And we have to understand differences uh, in day-to-day -day life in the United States with regard to what exists, not why it exists. Okay, so uh, just to state it up, up, uh, up front, two years ago, I published my book in Hebrew, Intelligence, The Unpleasant Truth. And many people said, hey, it's like an Hebrew version of the bell curve. So I quite uh, familiar and fond, and I think basically that your argument, uh, your arguments are solid and uh, true, but since I myself gone through the process of trying to explaining those things, with your permission, I would like to comfort you with what Steven Pinker said in his famous 2016 Harvard lecture about political correctness. He spoke about highly intelligent people that gravitate to the alt-right when they exposed to the first time to true statements like you describe in your book. And he said, and I quote, they never heard about it in academia or the New York Times or respectable media. And Pinker say that since this is their first encounter with those truths, they have no immunity and they feel outrage for being lied to. So you said, and you prove that this is not systemic racism, but what do I need to think about those facts? Or how can I both hold those truths and be immune against say, claims like, okay, one race is less violent than the other, therefore it is better. It shouldn't be hard, okay? Now I say that knowing that a lot of people find it to be hard, 
but it should not be if one realizes that you can have a difference in means with so many exceptions that you can't possibly make a judgment about an individual on the basis of their race. And let's just stick <clears throat> with uh, IQ as the example. <clears throat> it is true that there is a difference in means. It is also true that there are millions of black Americans who are smarter than millions of white Americans. And, and just, just looking at a person's face doesn't tell you whether that person uh, has struggles with school or whether that person is a Thomas Sowell who is a genius. Uh, you can't know that. So I find that easy to keep, to, to keep in my head. But I have to say to you <clears throat> that an awful lot of people who are otherwise very smart just can't seem to do it. They cannot, they cannot seem to think in terms of overlapping distributions. And they also way too quickly generalize from a difference in intelligence to a difference in human worth. And I think this is particularly true of academics. I think it is particularly true of people who have IQs because for many of them, their IQ is their own most important defining characteristic. And by the way, this holds true for academics who will say in print that IQ doesn't mean anything, that IQ is a, a stupid concept that we can't possibly measure intelligence. I assure you, these same people are intensely worried about how smart they are relative to their colleagues. Uh, what these people need to do is hang out more with a wider range of, of, of uh, their fellow citizens. So that if you, if you are spending time with, on a personal level, people who have IQs ranging from very high to ordinary or even below average, you will discover that a lot of people who have much lower IQs than you have are people you really admire. They are people who you enjoy being around, that you can have fun with them, uh, you can learn from them. A lot of times they do things for you that you cannot do for yourself. Uh, and and, and you, uh, you acquire appropriate humility. It's not, it's not forced humility. It's not the kind of thing where you say on a theoretical le le uh, level that uh, I, I, I hold everybody in respect. You genuinely respect them because you have personally experienced all the things besides IQ that go into your evaluation of the people around you. I think that it was Linda Gottfusson who said, my electrician, and my electrician makes much more money than I do, and he does think that I have no way of doing. But with your permission, since you mentioned Thomas Sowell, so the, there is a famous quote by him that in the beginning of the 20th century, the IQ differences were, or the intelligent differences, were mainly attributed to race by the Democrats, while by the end of the 20th century, the, same, the very same Democrat attributed those differences to racism. So we moved from race to racism, but I still want to stuck on this point because when I wrote my book, the hardest thing was to explain the difference between aggregate truth and particular truth, which, mm -hmm. what you call overlapping distribution. And this is very hard to explain that, you know, on average, but it means nothing on for the particular child. So I try to do it in many ways. Like if you take a, a, a kids with IQ of 90 and kids with IQ in 110, and you have no way to know 30 years forward what will happen with them. But only if you take a class where the average IQ is 90 and the average IQ is 110, you can say something about the aggregate outcome, which leads me to your great conversation with Coleman Hoggins. Some, and some blogger tweeted that this entire interview was a single question and a single answer. And I would go the other way around. How public do you think the findings of IQ and race should be? So obviously we don't want any sensor, but do we need to 
teach them in high school biology classes? Should it be part of public discourse? Because as Coleman Hogan's pointed out in your conversations, there can be obvious negative consequences of having this public discourse. You can give young black students a very negative self-image. Well, yeah, you can. And if you're talking about a practical question of should you teach it in the high schools, I would say no, for the same reason you shouldn't uh, teach particle physics in high school, that the high school curriculum in any ordinary high school is trying to impart basic knowledge and basic skills. And something like uh, differences in mean IQ between races is not something that falls into the category of one of those basic things you're trying to teach people. <clears throat> However, having said that, I think there is nothing that has been more damaging to the environment, the racial environment, than treating these differences as something scary. Um, <clears throat> you, you, you said earlier that some people discover they've been lied to. And, uh, and, and this sort of creates a, that radicalizes them. I think that does happen. <clears throat> and, and it would not happen if it were taken for granted. But hey, we have an empirical fact. But the empirical fact is you give test scores to people of different races and uh, they come out with different means. If that, were, if that kind of thing were just taken for granted, then it would be much easier to defuse it. And let me give you an example about a black kid who is told uh, that, that, uh, that his race has lower mean IQ uh, than white people. All right. Suppose we lived in a world where it was also considered okay to say in public, blacks are way better than whites at uh, uh, all sorts of sports. Uh, they are way overrepresented in all sorts of... Uh, of the arts, but suppose that we just talked about the ways in which different groups of people have these different profiles of abilities. And once you could do that, then you're saying to yourself, if you're a black child, which I'm, it's hard for me to you know, put myself in that place, but well, there are good things about the, the group to which I belong and there are bad things about the group to which I belong. Look. It's also wrong to think that we, any of us, judge our world in terms of what other people say about us. Now, I, my background, my, my ethnic heritage is Scots-Irish. And uh, most of listeners in Israel probably will not be familiar with the Scots-Irish, but they are a particular group of Scots who were emigrated from Scotland to Ireland, were there for a couple of centuries and came to the United States. And I grew up, as I read history, the Scots-Irish had a reputation for being drunk and violent, okay? They also had a reputation for being great pioneers, you know, exploring the West and that. Well, so they're kind of antisocial, they're kind of violent, they drink too much, but they also explored the West. And that combination of things uh, was something I was always very proud of, of being Scots-Irish. And for heaven's sakes, that you as a Jew are familiar with all the ways in which the world wants to tell you and does, has told you in the past very terrible things about what Jews do, all right? And is the, again, I can't put myself in the place of a Jewish child, but it seems to me pretty obvious that Jews have not heard all those things and said, oh, we must be horrible people. <laughs> They've said instead, here's what I know to be true. And, and by the way, I'm sure Jews among themselves talk about and make jokes about uh, all sorts of characteristics that are they wouldn't make in, in polite conversation. Just the way that whites make jokes about other whites and other white ethnic groups, just as blacks when they are among themselves will be candid about strengths and weaknesses. If we can do that within our own groups, isn't it healthy if we can to some extent try to do the same thing across groups? 
where we're kind of laughing at each other in some cases, admiring each other in other cases. I must tell you. I'll just, just, just add one more thing. That used to be fairly true in comedy, that in comedy, in American humor, you had brilliant black comedians, you had brilliant white comedians, and each of them would make jokes about the other, but in a, in a broader context where they were also making, making jokes about themselves. And that was much healthier. Okay, but now we have no safe zone. Uh, uh, I, I must tell you that my wife, when she discovered all the thing about intelligence, and if you have kids, you, you detect in a second that each child has a unique character, unique uh, feature. Some kids are much more intelligent than the other. And if you don't incorporate intelligence as being partly genetics, part of the traits that you are born with, it's going to be very cruel because you ask like some, some of your kids to level up to the more, to the more intelligent kid, but it's, unpass- it's impossible. And if you incorporate the discussion of intelligence and say, listen, he is good at that, and he's good at that, and he's good at that. So it, much more, it is much health, he- healthier discussion because I'm not expected to live up to the expectation where I cannot be. Would you uh, agree? Look at, look at the, con- I think your, your point is extremely important. But one of the best ways to think about racial differences is to think about your own children and the differences between them. But consider the contrast. If you have four children and uh, one of them is really, really smart and the other one is quite average, if you as a parent then say that you expect the, the child who is just average to get the same test scores, to get the same Uh, accomplishments in university and so forth, as the smarter kid, most people would say you are being a very bad parent, that you are being cruel and unfeeling and and, uh, insensitive to it. But if you are an American social scientist or educator, and you say, you know, kids whose strength does not lie in academic pursuits, but it lies in being good electricians, uh, being good plumbers, being being good cabinet makers, that they should pursue the stuff that they're good in. We shouldn't expect them to be nuclear physicists. But if, if you say that with regard to children of different races, you are accused of being a racist. It is called the bigotry of low expectations. If you treated your own children the same way you treat children of different races, uh, you would be criticized harshly and for good reason and by the way my oldest son is like a genius he's very very intelligent but we always say openly and discuss and say listen your sister she is less intelligent than you but she has grit and this grit has a major factor in her life therefore she moves faster because she can compensate with other attributes other as a feature that she has. So it's a very open discussion in our family that, okay, you might have more IQ, but she has something else, which is not less important. Not, not only does she have something else, she has something else that you can't do. And, and uh, you know, this I can't give her more IQ, I can't give him more grit, so. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I wish our educational system did better was to humiliate people who are really smart. And I will give you an example of how that can happen. When I was uh, 13 years old in, uh, in school, it was compulsory for all boys to take what is called shop. And shop is where you uh, learn carpentry, you learn uh, metalworking and the rest of this. Well, even at 13 years old, I was one of the smart kids in terms of IQ. And there I was in the class in shop and I wasn't very good at it. I tried, I tried hard. But these other boys who aren't nearly as smart as I was in an IQ sense could do much more beautiful, much more accurate work with wood and with metal and with fixing things than I could. 
And in one sense, I was humiliated. I had to recognize that I wasn't as good as they were. And that was a very healthy thing for me to have to understand. And unfortunately, since then, that no longer occurs. And if you are a really high IQ kid, you can go all the way through the educational system without ever being confronted with something that you can't do very well. Okay, so <laughs> this is great because we always, we always humiliate our uh, smart kid, but now we have per- permission from you. <laughs> so <laughs> let's move on to another related topic. In the IQ literature, some say race, some say ethnicity. In the bell curve, you chose the word ethnicity. Now, part two of your book, Human Diversity, is dedicated to the refutation of the claim that race is merely a social construct. Mm-hmm. Now, first, can you, can you explain what's the, what the difference between race and ethnicity is? And can we even encapsulate all the dark-skinned Americans as being black? Isn't it too vague group? Race is partly a social construct. It is partly a genetic construct. And <clears throat> the reason in human diversity that I, I dropped the use of the word race is the same reason that geneticists do. Because the word race now tries to group together everybody with a dark skin who comes from Sub-Saharan Africa. And the geneticists know that it's much more complicated than that, that different people are mixes of different groups. And so they talk about populations. They use the word populations and they call ancestral populations. Okay, and I think that's appropriate. And because here's a second truth that the geneticists know to be correct at this point, which they did not know 30 years ago. And that is, it's not just that you can Uh, determine whether someone is black or white, depending on their genetic makeup. You can determine whether they are Ashkenazi Jew or Sephardic. You can determine whether they are from Northern Italy or Southern Italy. You can, you can if you have genetic information, uh, make extremely accurate statements about someone's ethnic makeup. That's the reason why you have these commercial companies that I'm sure many Israelis have taken advantage of, which tell you you are 60% uh, uh, Russian Jewish background, you are 30% uh, uh, Southern German background and so forth and so on. And how do they know that? It's, it's entirely because of genes. So if race were nothing but a social construct, you couldn't do that. That's one point. The second point I'd like to make is that whereas it is true, that we are very complicated combinations of different ethnicities. When you do statistical analyses of DNA and <clears throat> you simply tell a statistical program, divide these people into groups based on the way they cluster. And you don't tell anybody anything about their race, just, just make sense of these statistical patterns And uh, they, they fall into the ancestral continents, Sub-Saharan Africa, East Asia, South Asia, Europe, and, uh, and the Americas. This is important. Absolutely. Just What's a second. Hmm? Just a second, because this is important, because I think that the, uh, uh, there, there is, a big, uh, is a big argument against what you just said, that you need to supply the software The number of clusters but you said okay even I supply even no. I give the program the number of cluster it will cluster according to what people say and say okay so if I will cluster to three different groups it will be black whites and uh, yellow <laughs> and if and if I will uh, and if I will uh, uh, cluster to more group I will get like eventually I will get the difference between the I, uh, Ireland and Scotland and England. Right. And it's, and, and it's purely statistical. <laughs> There's, there is no information given to the program. It just says, look up the patterns. Look, you know, people, very few people who are watching are statisticians, uh, I imagine. Uh, but uh, here's perhaps something that I can illustrate using 
only a correlation coefficient. Correlation coefficient is goes from minus one to plus one, and plus one uh, means that two populations are exactly the same from low to high. And the cor a correlation of 0.98 is really, really high. Well, if you take a whole lot of genetic variants from Chinese and from Japanese, the correlation between all kinds of traits, not just IQ, but blood pressure and uh, uh, height and you, you name it, whatever the trait is, the correlations are about 0.98 or 0.99. In other between words, Japanese probably, and Chinese? Between Japanese and Chinese. So they're very, very close. Similarly, if you take uh, Blacks from Kenya and Blacks from Nigeria, their correlations on traits are about 0 0.98, 0 0.99. And similarly for Europeans. Now suppose you take Chinese and Kenyans and you take the same traits, you look at the correlations, now the correlations are on the range of about 0.7. <clears throat> well, 0.7 is still a reasonably high correlation, but it's way different from 0.98. And similarly, the correlations between Asians and Europeans are in the about 0.7. So in other words, you have a lot of commonality, but you also have very easily observable statistical differences. And that, by the way, is not a controversial statement in terms of the science, uh, it is- Unless you're Nicholas yeah. Wade who write it in Troublesome Inter in <laughs> yeah, Inheritance, and then it is or do. <laughs> now, I, I must tell you a story. Uh, by the way, I bought this book as uh, because you recommended with your uh, interview with uh, Stephen Molinox. Oh, said, Listen, also, yeah. This is a great, a great, a great book. Now, I must tell you a story. Last year, I had a conversation with Gary Jones, the IQ researcher, the economist, the author of Meinheim. And he pointed out th something extremely interesting. He said that people are afraid to attribute cognitive differences to genetics, and they rather say it is all about culture. And the late James Flynn, Richard Nisbet are good examples. But Gary Jones points out that it is much more probable that in the near future, we will be able to solve genetic problems using research and technological breakthrough. And it is much less probable that we will be able to solve cultural problems. So maybe the genetic research that you describe can be an optimistic window to the future of saying, listen, it is mainly genetics, but in the near future, we will be able to solve some of those problems. What do you think? Oh. What's your take on that? Well, in, in the distant future, that's definitely the case because sooner or later, we will have gene editing and uh, so forth that, that can, well, initially there are certain diseases that it will definitely make a difference on. Cognition is a more complicated problem because you have tens of thousands of genetic variants that go into cognition, but the broad statement in the distant future is that we can be confident there will be genetic solutions to some problems, whereas we have really run up against a brick wall in trying to use environmental interventions, uh, let alone to change culture itself. So in that sense, I agree with him. And I also agree in another sense. Myopia is a highly genetic uh, visual problem. But in fact, it's completely genetic. On the other hand, we invented glasses. And once you invent glasses, myopia is not nearly as much of a problem anymore. And similarly, uh, mathematics uh, talent has a large genetic component. But if you have a calculator, there are all sorts of ways in which that's less important in getting along in the world. So there are all sorts of ways you can compensate through technology and so forth. Having said that, I would, I think it's also important to become comfortable in talking about differences in groups among people that we can't fix, can't change. Uh, okay. I must tell you another story about Gary Jones. He told me that the late James Flynn wanted to, to have researchers in, in the US 
that will help him uh, prove that intelligence was mainly in environmental, but he didn't find any, and he suspected that the intelligence researchers in the US afraid that such a, a rigorous a research will eventually say, yes, it is genetics, and they didn't want their name to be on those findings. So yeah. we still in this nurture, nature nurture debate, but you know, from the publication of the bell curves, we have intelligence by Earl Hunt, we have human intelligence by Macintosh, we have the neuroscience of intelligence by Richard Heyer in 2017, we have in the know by Russell Warren, and it is not, if we, if we glance, if we look, and I, re, I have read all the textbooks, it seems that no one can escape the fact that intelligence is in part or in big part genetics, you know, the twin studies, all the other th things, uh, intelligent that the, the just the mere fact that you can look using fMRI at the human brain and say, okay, this correlates with IQ, I think says something profoundly important about intelligence being mainly genetics, no? Yeah, there's, <clears throat> there's really no scientific controversy about is intelligence itself highly heritable and genetic? Not within, not among the people who know the data, including geneticists. So it's probably, well, it changes over the lifespan. So that for children, the heritability of IQ is, is sometimes in the region of 0.3 or 0.4, which is fairly low. Uh, whereas among mature adults, it's in the range of 0.6 to 0.8, which is quite high. Yeah. So there's no controversy about that. And even when you're talking about differences among groups, I think that we are in a situation in which people know what's going on scientifically and just don't want to talk about it. There is a geneticist named uh, David Reich who uh, teaches at Harvard, a well-respected professor. He wrote She's a great a book. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah uh, he wrote a wonderful book of uh, where we uh, where we come from. He, that's not quite the title. Anyway, he is also uh, not a conservative scholar. He's uh, a standard liberal scholar in terms of his politics. But he has said cautiously but publicly that, you know, we just have to stop digging ourselves into this hole saying that you cannot possibly have genetic differences across races. He says, because I think he used the phrase, we are about to be overwhelmed by a tsunami of data saying the opposite. And we just have to start to come to grips with that. I think that that's a very widely held view at this point, but there is so much intellectual terrorism going on in America these days that I think people are hunkered down and just don't want to talk about it. By the way, I read David Reich's book and it, it seems like he opens the door quite open, but he refused to enter. It refused to enter because it, <laughs> it, 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 it uh, <laughs> okay, this is the data, therefore, and he refused to make the extra step, which is in some way transparent with all the data that he, uh, that, that he supplied. So let's move on with your permission to one even more interesting subject, which is faith and reason. Now in modern society, people point out that the majority of intellectual and scientists in America, for example, are either irreligious or openly anti-religious, atheist, etc. Mm -hmm. So why one, why do you think th this is so? This is a question of IQ, that atheists have a higher IQ, and if so, why? Or it's just because religious people score lower on openness? Oh, there are so many explanations, but, uh, but I'll just uh, give one that I think you will recognize from your own experience. Uh, when I went to college, and I went to Harvard, when I got to college, it was just sort of the cultural attitude about religion that only stupid people believe that anymore. Smart people don't believe that stuff anymore. 
And when you're 18, 19, 20 years old, uh, and you are around people who you want to be part of and you want to join that group and you respect them, you imbibe that attitude. In the 19th century, you, 18th century especially, you would have been just as doc, indoctrinated into the opposite point of view about, well, maybe I should go back to pre-enlightenment. But, but in any case, culture has a huge amount to do with whether people are religious or not. Uh, and intellectuals have been living in a very uh, anti-religious environment now for the last couple of centuries. That's, mm -hmm. that's one thought. And, the, and, and what I take away from that is that these days you have a lot of really ignorant atheists. And by ignorant atheists, I mean, they have not contemplated, let me put it in terms of Christianity since I'm uh, of a Christian heritage, uh, they have not read Christian theology and said, no, I don't think I accept that. They say, well, you have these Bible stories about Jesus and I don't believe them. Uh, these, those are just fairy tales and therefore uh, I reject Christianity. <laughs> you know, that's, I could be, I could use similar uh, uh, analogies with Judaism. Oh, against but, your book, The Bell Curve. Just try to read the book first and then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so you, you have a lot of people who are very anti-religious now who've never really thought very seriously about it and never taken seriously a lot of the, the reasons that it should be taken seriously. So I'm not speaking as a person who is a person of deep faith at this point, um, but I have evolved in my thinking over the last 20 years or so, whereas I think it's really important to take religion seriously. And whatever your conclusions at the end of it, stop thinking that uh, only stupid people believe that stuff. In the case of the United States, the head of the National Institutes for Health and a very accomplished uh, scientist uh, uh, has just uh, left that, that position, uh, Francis uh, Collins. He is deeply religious and has written books about how is it that you can be a scientist and also deeply religious. And that's the kind of thing that I think a lot of people who are casually non-religious need to confront, need to think about. When I spoke with Michael Shermer about it, and I told him that I think that nowadays, like 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, if you were an intellectual, you must adopted some anti-religious beliefs, anti-religious opinions. But I think that Jordan Peterson and other guys as well, now religion goes back to the main, uh, like a main uh, opinion, yes? That it is reasonable. Peterson takes religion back to the intellectual life and says, listen, we have something to learn from the ancient. This is not just like fairy tale stories. This okay. is very deep and we have something to learn from it. And from this, I want to go to like the Jews, for example, the Jews in America are the leaders of the atheist movement. And many Jews in America associated with the radical leftist, left stances, pro progressive, communist, Bernie Sanders, et cetera. So how do you think that this conflict between reason and faith plays out among the Jews? Are they any different than the Christian or because the Jews have like an, a, a different heritage of intellectual studying? Well, first you're asking the wrong person in the sense that uh, you know a lot more about Judaism in this regard than I do, but let me just make a couple of observations. And, and these are anecdotal. Uh, from personal friends of ours. For example, we have more than one family of, of Jewish friends who are extremely observant. Uh, and, in fact, in one case, very strictly kosher uh, in the observance of, of everything. They do not consider themselves to be religious 
but the way that, and one of them, by the way, is a physicist, a nuclear physicist. And he says, look, these, th these traditions have worked for thousands of years. And it's a way of life that has deep meaning. And we are going to observe uh, th this tradition because we think it will enrich our life. Well, now, where do you put this? Are these people religious or not if they still aren't sure they believe in God? And, and I don't think you need to answer that in a strict sense because I think one of the insights about religion that's true of, of certainly of Christianity and of Judaism alike is that people are not observant because they have faith they have faith because they are observant. And a, a Christian friend of mine puts it this way. He says, look, and he's a Catholic. He says, just go to mass regularly for a few months and you don't have to uh, say you believe it. You don't have to try to persuade yourself to believe it, uh, but simply enter into it and see if over the course of those months, that something changes, that, that, that you, you are open to new ways of looking at things, to things that you were not open to before. And I think that's profoundly true. Um, and I think that, I, I, I wonder, I'll put it in this way, I don't know if it's true. I sense that there is among uh, Jews in America, a tendency to move back toward either observing the traditions or becoming more actively religious. That's a sense that I have. I don't have any numbers to back it up. How about in Israel? In Israel, I think that uh, in terms of Israeli, I think that Israel is like the, if, if Israel is a Western country, I think that is the most religious, the most religious Western country in the world. So, I think that the only place where the only place where uh, religious or religion and high in, in intellectual achievement goes side by side is Israel. And I will going to address this question later on. But let's. I, I just want to mention one thing is that you say, just go to a mass and, and do it for several months. There is a profound statement in, in Jewish tradition, Nasevenishma. First do and then think about what you are doing. So start by doing, and it's like Aristotle. Don't think by don't start by thinking what best, just start by doing, and eventually you will uh, the, all the philosophy will come afterwards. Now, I will just, I'll just add one more thing here. I have become convinced of this much over the last 20 years, that there are ways of knowing that are richer than a very strict rationalist post-enlightenment view. And in fact, it is a kind of hubris uh, for intellectuals to think that the human mind is capable of figuring this stuff out by ourselves. Because if we know one thing to be true, we know this beyond doubt. If there is a God, it is as far beyond our comprehension as uh, it is beyond the comprehension of our dogs to understand what we do when we're working on the computer. We, we, there needs to be a sense of humility about our own ability to understand the universe. That's what I'm saying. For the last year, I've been teaching the philosophy of Maimonides in the Guide for the Perplexed. And uh, yeah. it, it, it basically says the very same thing that you said just, just now. And if we quote Spinoza or Spinoza, he said in his theological uh, article, he said, just try to imagine an infinite fly. You cannot, something or some thoughts are restricted by your own mind. But with your permission, let's go to the Jews because obviously I'm a Jew and I'm interested in those things. Many people try to address the question of the Jewish genius. Now, Richard Glynn and Nicholas Wade, to just name a few, just to give one statistic that you bring, in 1954, a psychologist used IQ test results to identify all 28 children in the New York public school system 
with measured IQ of 170 or higher, of those 28, 24 were Jews. Now, some of the explanation involved genetics and culture. Mendelian disease for Ashkenazi Jews, for example, is a genetic uh, explanation. But the tendency for of the richest man in the village to seek out the most intelligent groom for his daughter is cultural. Now, what do you think of the roots for this phenomenon of disproportional intellectual Jews in the West? And would you consider all the Jews to be one encapsulated pile, or you do divide between Ashkenazi, Sephardi, like Nicholas Wade and Richard Lynn does do? Yeah, well, I, I wrote an article about this for Commentary Magazine uh, uh, about 15 years ago, and I have to say, it is a fascinating question. I uh, read it. There's, there's uh, a couple of things. Uh, it is not clear that the uh, respect for marrying your daughter to a, a, a scholar, that is, that is part of the tradition, but it's not clear that that alone would explain a lot. And certainly it is not the case that the persecution of the Jews uh, means that, oh, well, they, they were forced to uh, get smarter because of all of the, the uh, persecution, because in fact, you know, a pogrom does not distinguish between the smart and the stupid in terms of who gets killed in the pogrom. Uh, there are lots of reasons not to buy into that. Here's what I think are the most plausible explanations right now. And I stress the word plausible. Uh, there was a huge transition of Jews from agricultural occupations to uh, ones that involved finance and uh, the economy and so forth. This has been documented by Gregory Cochran and Henry Harpending in a famous dis uh, discussion of Ashkenazi Jews. And that, that transition really did occur. Uh, I would go back further and look at a couple of other ways in which Jews had a real selection process that may have had huge results. The first one was uh, in about the first century of the common era when, with the destruction of the temple and also the, uh, the, the, the contemporaneous uh, increase in the demands of good Jews that they become literate. Jewish males had to learn how to read. And this is part of the transition of Judaism from a religion of the temple to a religion of the book, which was of course accelerated by the destruction of the temple in 70 CE. Okay, that is by, by 200 or 300 CE, in order to be a good Jew, you had to be able to read the Torah. That is not easy. And <clears throat> I think that becoming a, being a good Jew just became intellectually much more demanding. But you can go back further to the Babylonian exile. And the Bible is extremely explicit that the Babylonians, uh, the Assyrians took, took only the elite Jews to uh, Babylonia. It took the, the, the smartest people. In the, and also when they returned, the Jews who returned uh, were instructed in the Bible not to mix with those who would remain. These are huge selection events in terms of, of, uh, of, of, of the genetic pool that Jews were coming from. I stress that both of these are hypotheses uh, because actually we have a further difficulty if we go say, well, it started with the Babylonian exile. Even before then you had Jews who had who had developed monotheism, which is a major cultural feat, and had also put together a Bible, which was a major literary accomplishment. And this was before the Babylonian exile. And so <clears throat> you, you, it goes back a very long way, in my opinion. And at this point, it, uh, well, the final paragraph of my article on Jewish genius is one of my favorite last paragraphs where I say, look, at this point, I'm out of ideas, except my final hypothesis, which is happily irrefutable, the Jews are God's chosen people. <laughs> it is my very favorite ending to an article. But, but 
I, I, I just would like to encourage uh, people who are watching this, don't be afraid to explore this. Yes, Jews are smarter than uh, uh, just about any other uh, ethnic group in the world. Maybe the Parsis are up there with, with uh, Ashkenazi Jews, but that's about the only group. And don't be afraid of that. Uh, don't be afraid to explore the reasons for it. It's one of those things that's basically fascinating. You and know, it doesn't mean that Jews are the superior race. It just means that, the, that Jews have, have a, a certain intellectual facility which has had enormous consequences, mostly for the good. You know, when I wrote my book and I said, listen, I'm not going to discuss Israel for two reasons. One, just mention, you know, Ashkenazi Sephardi in Israel is extremely inflammatory. And two, we have no information whatsoever. It's not like the EAP, the EPA, the, the, the a APA, yes, American Psychologists Association, where they have all the data, including divided two races. We have nothing in Israel. And I would even go further and say, since in Israel, we have like intermarriage between Ashkenazi and Sephardi, and I myself, my mother is Sephardi, my father is Ashkenazi, my wife as well. So the, all the differences between those Ashkenazi Sephardi uh, starts to diminish, I think, and I hope in Israel, where in the US, where inter, uh, inter-race marriage are less common. Yeah, well, and also for that matter, look, the Sephardic tradition is pretty impressive. Maimonides was Sephardic, right? Uh, uh, Disraeli was, uh, Ricardo was. Uh, there were, you know, there is a, uh, an argument that a great deal of the prosperity that came to the Netherlands uh, was the result of the, the Jews who fled the Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition. Well, there was Sephardi. So, I, I've, I not only sympathize with your point about in Israel, what's, what's, you know, what good would it do to try to, to uh, separate this? Uh, I, think that's, I think that's correct. And we still don't, but unfortunately, the Ethiopian Jews are still married between themselves, which is like, kind of like between the black and the white in America. And this is a major problem in both in Israel and in the US. Now, well, I am just yes. wanted to say quickly, you have not made public policies, to my knowledge, that uh, distinguish between Sephardi and uh, and Ashkenazi Jews, right? So just, that you just, don't have, just you don't have affirmative Jews. action. If in the United States we had no affirmative action, if if we were still just trying to you know treat people according to their abilities as opposed to the color of their skin. I would not be writing about race. We have created a problem, a public policy problem in the United States that did not need to exist. In Israel, as, this, as far as the Sephardic and Ashkenazi issues, you have not done that. So just leave it alone. Okay, <laughs> very well. So uh, my editor, uh, Shai Rosenman, asked me to ask this question. And I think that this is very interesting subject now the zionism yeah the zionism is revolution because they claim in essence that they're not just a territorial movement they they claim that they would change the jewish psyche they will change the jewish character because outside the land of israel they claim the jew was by definition an abnormal he wasn't normal he was neurotic like woody allen thing his pyramid was upside down. He had the higher function or the higher, the higher faculties or the intellectual function were very developed and his lower function were not developed at all. And the lower function associated with the lower segment of society, soldiers, farmers, etc. And the young state of Israel gave birth to a new kind of Jew, which is in a way less intellectual than the American Jew but on the other end is more normal. And by normal, I also mean more religious. And I would say that it is not a coincidence that out of all Jewish Nobel winners, the only two religious, uh, Shai Agnon for literature and Israel Uman for economics, were Israelis. So what's your take on that? 
could be like, could be that the state of Israel develop a new kind of Jew, which is less intellectual because he's more occupied with the lower segment of human existence? It's a fascinating question <clears throat> because it has also been noted. Thank you, Shia. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it, it has also been noted that once Jews were emancipated, they seemed to, in terms of their accomplishments in the arts and sciences, they seemed to benefit from being in a Christian society in Europe. And I don't attach any religious significance to this. It's kind of an empirical statement that it appears that Christian societies provided an environment after emancipation. So now we're talking the 19th century uh, in which Jewish accomplishment really flourished. And there have been arguments made. And I think I'm looking back at my shelf of books. Uh, and there's one by, I think, Pataki. Does that, anyway, uh, by Jewish, Jewish scholars who have speculated about the interaction of the two cultures. So when I say it's a fascinating question, there are all sorts of possibilities. One is that, uh, that the Israeli experiment means that you're going to have less sensational achievement than in the Jews who live outside. Another way of looking at it is that Jew, Jews in Israel are becoming more complete human beings and people in terms of their character, as you just described. And this puts us in a realm where people could get very excited and emotional about either of those two positions. And I would say, look, this is what social science can do. Social science can look at those questions and the answers that will come up eventually, if they're explored carefully, will be a little bit of both. Are there good things about being Jewish in a, in a, in a historically Christian society? Maybe yes. Are there good things about being a Jew in, in, uh, in Israel that you can't match elsewhere? Probably yes, but it's gonna be a complicated answer as well as a complicated question. Uh, you, you've muted yourself now. I don't want to interrupt you. So every time, every time you speak, I just silence myself because <laughs> I, I, have a, I, I have like an intrinsic chutzpah. So I try to work on my intrinsic chutzpah using the mute function. And, but maybe again, the, normal, the normal existence of the Jewish people is more religious. I think that there was a poll in the 80s in the US that the Jews were 2% of the population, but 30% of cult population. So the Jew must be somewhere in, in some sort of deity or something very high, very moral uh, activities. And the state of Israel let them be themselves. So it's just a, just a thought. Now, with your permission, can I ask you one more thing? Mm -hmm. Because sure. it, 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 okay. Now, I want to ask you about the, I, I hope I, I say it correctly, bio, 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 biologization, okay? So you can say it for yourself. So biologization of the social sciences. Now that we have genetics and we have neuroscience, it seems that for the first time ever, we can answer very serious questions with real scientific metrics. Now, do you understand people who might be afraid of it? Yeah, I understand the instinctive reaction that leads them to be afraid of it because people and the intellectuals especially seem to think that ordinary people are bigots and racists and bad people who, if you give them certain access to certain knowledge, they're going to do terrible things with it, okay? Because they don't hang I, out I with regular that, people. Yeah, I hear that all the time, that Charles, you know, uh, yes, what you say may be true, but don't you understand how people are gonna misuse that? Well, I'll tell you what my experience has been. 
because I live in a place which is not in academia. I live in a small town in rural Maryland, know all kinds of people. I have never had the experience of any of those people who are just waiting for a chance to be bigoted, nasty people. Um, I think much more harm has been done by denying that we can even think about the role of biology. The effects that this has had because of the mistakes that intellectuals make are enormous. Uh, if it is true, well, I'm, I'm thinking about something that Dick Kernstein, my co-author in The Bell Curve, said to me, and I think it ended up in the book, but it was, it was Dick who had the original way of putting it. He said, if, if what we say in this book is not true, there is no good time to say it. If what we say in this book is true, there is no bad time to say it. Oh, and, this is great. Yeah, and, 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 and I would go further at this point and say, we have now had 60 years of experience in the United States of trying to ignore truths, whether they are from nature or nurture, that people afraid or fear will be harmful if we talk about them. That 60 years of experience has produced the worst racial polarization in American uh, post-war history. It is putting Americans at each other's throats because of ethnicity in ways that it hasn't since the worst days of slavery and reconstruction. And I suggest that our experience over the last 50 or 60 years say, we damn well better start talking about these kinds of topics that people have been scared of because not talking about them has been toxic. I, I read in some place that people treat this area as Jim Crow 2.0. So it is very Jim Crow 2.0. So mm -hmm. the next election cycle is going to be very interesting. But since the biologization of is basically true, my question is, how does it scale? If each person is a character that is partly genetics and each person belongs to a nation which has similar genetics, do those issues scale up? Would you say to a national character or a national per personality. Because in ancient society or traditional society or in Judaism, we believe that each nation is a destiny. We are the guardian angel that guide its destiny. Would you believe in such a thing that each nation has a unique character? Oh, in terms of the United States, until recently, there wasn't any question about that. Uh, Americans, really did in 1776 and 1787 <clears throat> with the constitution, Americans really did start a completely different kind of nation that no other nation in the world was like in terms of democracy and getting rid of institutions of aristocracy and monarchy. It was, it was a huge American experiment. And for the next 200 years, Americans thought of their country as being incredibly special. That has been our history. At this point, I think you're looking at, in terms of the United States, um, a decline in that, a very steep decline in that among the intellectual classes. And uh, the, our future doesn't look very bright. But in terms of your question, I don't think that understanding the role of genes and biology in creating a behavior really competes with the idea of culture also playing a role. Because look, we are a nation of immigrants. We have people come from all over the world. And again, until recently, we were very good at changing their cultures enormously to fit in with America's culture. That's not genetic, uh, that's cultural. And uh, so I don't think that at heart, 
these are competing things. You can study the biology the, on which the social sciences rest, and you are in no way shortchanging the role of the non-genetic factors. With your permission, I would like, first, thank you so much. With your permission, I would like to give like a final summary. This is the Hebrew version. This is a Hebrew book, Intelligence, the Unpleasant Truth of me. And this is, a, oh yes. And we have like the Pandora box with the smoke being the double helix. And I, I opened with two quotes, I think that summarize what our discussion, our conversation so far. One is by Thomas Jefferson, that nothing is more unequal than the equal treatment of unequal people, which leads to, what we said about education and your, your insight that we need to humiliate the smart kids in to make sure that everything, that, that each one is special in his own way. And the other is a song from the Prince of Egypt, which is a single thread in, the, in a tapestry, though its color brightly shines, can never see its purpose in the pattern of the grand design. And the stone that sits on the very top on the mountain's mighty face, does it think it's more important than the stone that formed the base? And then he said, listen, basically, nice. you cannot measure yourself by human metrics. You must measure yourself by God's metrics. And I think, and this is the conclusion of my book, that the only way to discuss intelligence openly is bringing back God back into the picture and say, listen, he is more intelligent and he is less intelligent, but the value, the intrinsic value of a human being is not within the realm of human. Only God can inspect, only God can measure the intrinsic value. And therefore all the eugenic movements in the beginning of the 20th century were, were, were secular movement because a religious, a religious philosophy cannot live with the eugenic movement. I think that you are precisely right. Uh, and uh, I, I put it this way, the idea that a God worthy of the name thinks of one person as being better than another person because they get a better score in the IQ test is ridiculous. <laughs> and, and, and if you think of it that way, of course it's ridiculous and it's, it's just, it's humans in the absence of religion that I think are subject to all the evils of hubris based way too much on their inflated view of the importance of IQ. Wow, Dr. Charles, Charles Murray, thank you so much for the interview, for the conversation. It was mind blowing, like always reading your work, but now I had finally the chance, the opportunity to speak with you person in person. It was a great experience. Thank you so much. I truly enjoyed it. I did too. Thanks very much. Okay. Bye-bye.